Russia, Christy, South Africa, and it's good to be back with you at the start of the new year. Uh, this is going to be our first uh, interview this year for 2021, and uh, we welcome all of you students who are familiar with us and others, and also uh, welcome uh, new folks who might be listening into our interview uh, this evening. Um, my name is Simon Brace. I'm with Russia, Christy. I work at uh, Northwest University. Russia, Christy is a student campus ministry, which is based now at five the campuses in South Africa. And uh, we now seek to uh, encourage Christians on campus and professors in their faith by teaching them about the reasons for Christianity so that they are better equipped to, first of all, understand their own faith. And secondly, being able to answer the questions and objections that inevitably come in conversations with non-Christians and uh, to be able to give a reason for the hope that is within. And so we are campus apologetics ministry and we have a website so do feel free to take a look at that where we have uh, weekly articles coming out and other resources for you so do look at our our site rashachristi.co.za and we have a youtube channel as well which has a growing uh, a number of videos and recordings uh, recommended uh, um, recordings of other things debates uh, talks and other things that we recommend to folks that you can go and see as well, dealing with all kinds of topics um, related to Christianity and various other issues, as important issues as well. So it's our privilege to have you this evening and a privilege this evening to introduce you to our, our, our guest this evening, um, uh, John. John is with an organization called Zima. And the subject that we're going to be tackling this evening, and I'll get to John now, but the subject, let me just get the subject uh, material, is we're going to be talking this evening about uh, the Zion Christian Church in South Africa. Uh, many of you South Africans will know or have seen the ZCC. Um, this is the, the same group of people. And ZCC uh, followers typically are often identified in public with lapels that they wear on their shirts. And uh, if you look carefully at the green, it's often a green uh, bit of material behind a, a badge. And the badge will typically be either a star or a dove. Um, and so we, we, we're going to look this evening at the history of the ZCC and all of the other uh, broader movements associated with this, this group of, of, of followers in South Africa. Um, most South Africans are very unfamiliar with the history of the ZCC, as I was. And um, hopefully this evening uh, you will be not only better equipped to understand the history of the ZCC and the movement and why it matters, but you might even be... Uh, surprised and, and actually staggered by the opportunity that exists amongst the ZCC and the broader groups associated with the ZCC in South Africa. Uh, missionary organizations across the world who examine um, missions work across the nations, some have said that this might, the, the, the ZCC community and its broader uh, group of followers might be one of the greatest um, uh, outreach opportunity that exists in the globe today. Now, to many South Africans, we want to wonder why that's the case. And hopefully this evening you'll see why. And um, we have somebody this evening who's going to unpack that for us. And so we uh, will dive into that now. Let me just uh, get back to John now, who's our speaker. John is actually uh, from the United States, and uh, he is working with an organization called Zema, Z-E-M-A. And they also have the information will be at, at, on the bottom of our of the video there that you're going to see the details there so you can connect with John as well. And so he is based in the Eastern Cape working with this organization that does work amongst the Zionists in South Africa and sometimes also known as the Amai Zioni. So John, good evening and welcome to Russia, Christy, South Africa. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk with you about this important issue. 
Uh, maybe if you can begin with John, just tell us a little bit about your family and uh, uh, and where about you're based, and then where you're from as well. That might be handy as well. Yeah, my wife and I um, we're from uh, the Midwest in America, uh, in between Chicago and Milwaukee, and we met uh, while studying at Trinity in Deerfield, Illinois. Uh, God's blessed us with three uh, children. They were all born here in South Africa. Um, we've had a really blessed experience living in South Africa. Uh, we arrived at the beginning of 2011, so um, been here a little while. And uh, God has placed us in uh, Ganubi, just outside of East London, in the Eastern Cape. And it's a great place to live and raise a family. And uh, the ministry, which we'll talk about uh, more this evening, it's a great place for the ministry uh, in terms of reaching out to the, um, the Zionist people which we'll, we'll explain more of what we mean by that. Um, so, yeah, we're very thankful to be in the Lord's will, serving him here in South Africa. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, why don't you get started then, John, and, and then run us through the history of the Zionist movement in South Africa. I might well jump in there whilst you're talking and just ask a few questions as well. Um, and for those of you who are watching on YouTube, do feel free to post your questions on the sidebar there on YouTube. And those will be fed through to me, and if you have questions, we can tackle John towards the end of the interview. All right, John, over to you then. All right, well, yeah, thanks for setting it up in that way, Simon. Uh, just talking about, uh, you know, why is this issue relevant? Um, yeah, just to go along with what you were saying, uh, if you look at, say, the just in South Africa, for example, the, the Kosa, the Zulu, uh, the Sutu, if you talk about these African groups, um, it's estimated that about a quarter of that population belongs to this group that we're talking about, uh, which part of which would be the ZCC and other Zionist groups who are all tracing back to the same um, beginning in the early 1900s. So it's a massive group of people. And if you look beyond South Africa into other countries in Southern Africa, totally, and I mean, we don't have a, a sure number, but uh, there's good reason to believe that we could be talking about 15 to 18 million people in Southern Africa who belong to the same um, movement. So it's, it's really an important uh, issue, understanding who these people are, um, where they come from, and how God is currently at work um, reaching out to these people. So it's a really, really exciting work that God is doing and uh, a really interesting history, which I, I do like to talk about. It. So I'm glad for that opportunity. Um, so, so yeah, once you understand that uh, there's this large group of people, that it's, like you said, it's, uh, it's a fast-growing religious movement, probably the fastest in Africa, um, because it started uh, about 120 years ago in South Africa. So if you can just kind of do the math in your head, 120 years, now you've got 15, 18 million people. That's a huge, uh, a fast uh, growing religious movement. But you, there's a lot of misunderstanding, I think, in people's minds in terms of uh, how this movement started, uh, even amongst the, the Zionist people, the ZCC possibly even. Um, you know, in many of their minds, they may not have a clear understanding of how this movement started. So it's really important to understand the history behind this, and that will lead us into you know why, as Christians, you know this is really important to understand because there's a, an open door here because of the history. So um, I think yeah, I would like to just try to take us back, and I'll do the best I can to explain some of the key moments of the early history, just to, to uh, you know clarify to people how this movement started, what it, it was meant to be, and um, I think that'll be a good start for us. Now, uh, some of you might be aware of it, but um, this movement goes back all the way to kind of late 1800s. Um, there was a movement that started called Zion, and uh, it was started by a minister, John Alexander Dowie. He was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, his family migrated to Australia. He went back to Edinburgh, um, I believe, and studied. And 
um, ended up going back to Australia and became a minister of the Congregational Church. And uh, it was a really interesting time that he was living in. Um, there was a lot of challenges in terms of the ministry, a lot of criticism towards the Bible. Um, Darwinism was really affecting uh, the church at that time. It was unsettling uh, people's faith, Christian faith. And there was a real need for the church uh, to really take a strong stance on uh, believing the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible. Um, and uh, John Alexander Dowie was one of those key people at that time in the church that was, had a very strong voice defending the inerrancy of Scripture. And um, some yeah, interesting things happened that kind of propelled him into uh, the ministry further from being kind of a local pastor. But it basically it became a very um, fast-growing movement around the world. And... Um, Part of that had to do with a plague that went through Australia at the time, and it was killing a lot of people. I, I believe um, 40 people died um, in a very short amount of time just in his church. So he buried literally 40 people in his church congregation in a very short amount of time. And that led him to you know, better understandings of the Bible, how to care for his people as a pastor. And that kind of really uh, propelled his evangelistic world into become more of a worldwide evangelistic work. He ended up, um, him and his wife then went to um, America, and they had children. Um, and he did a lot of ministry along the West Coast and um, a lot of good work. He ended up uh, making his headquarters in Chicago around the time of the World Fair, which was really significant. You had people from all over coming to Chicago and uh, the Lord opened a door for that work, uh, and he impacted many people, not just in the Chicagoland area, but many people coming to Chicago. And um, just in many different ways like that, uh, the Zion movement became actually like a household term. People at that time, they knew, okay, the Zion movement, they knew of John Alexander Dowie, the ministry he was a part of. This is a Protestant evangelical movement. Um, so I think that's important. That's one of the things I would like to just um, explain tonight. When we talk about Zion, you know, where the ZCC, the Zion Christian Church, where they get their name from the Zion movements, it's a very um, solid, biblical, evangelical, Protestant Christian movement. Uh, you, you really have to go back to the history to understand this when you're just looking at the, the ZCC and other Zion groups here. Uh, where they come from is a very, very solid Christian movement. Now, it's uh, it's interesting the way it came to South Africa. You know, as you guys know, around the turn of the century was a, a very interesting time here in South Africa, too, with the Anglo-Boer War, for example. Um, that had a huge effect on the country, and I, I'm very interested just to, to learn about that as I have researched you know, the Zion history. Um, and, and really that was a significant part of how the Zion movement you know, really settled in here to South Africa. Um, one thing people don't know, um, which I find really interesting, is that, that uh, the Zion movement, one of the things they really championed, you could say, which was way ahead of their time, was this issue of um, equality among nations. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dowie in particular, uh, he, um, he really pushed in many different ways was that there's no difference between nationalities in terms of importance or superiority. And at that time, <laughs> many people disagreed with them. And uh, so anyways, um, when the movement came to South Africa, uh, many people were hurting especially amongst the, you could say, the Boer and the Anglo-South Africans. Uh, the war had just ended, and um, the Zion movement actually started to help heal um, people who were affected by the war. And, for example, uh, one of the Zion churches in Johannesburg uh, had Boers and Anglos uh, there together, worshiping, coming together, you know, these people never would have come together at that time, just after the war, if it wasn't for the 
power of Christ, you know, people repenting and coming to, to Christ. And Zion was a big part of that. And uh, what's interesting that, then is that this wasn't just a movement that started with the Zulus and the Sutus. It actually started first with uh, the Anglos and Boers, you know, at that time. They were right in the mix. It actually kind of all happened at the same time. The Zion movement was going out to all these different people groups at the same time. Now, it became pretty quickly, predominantly, you know, then moving toward the direction of, um, you saw major growth happening then with the Zulus, Sutus, and of course the Tosas and all various different African groups. Um, but it started even including, you know, the, the Boers and Anglos. They were definitely a big part of that mix. So we'll get more into that, but yeah, I just find that interesting. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to really explain that, you know, when we talk about the Zion movement, which is where the ZCC and these others, you know, trace their roots back to, we're, we're talking about a very sound uh, biblical church movement. And it, it's not perfect by any means, like any other, you know, good Christian church movement. Yeah, you can find areas to critique and learn from and improve. But really, it was, um, it was a strong Christian work and very much founded on the gospel. And repentance and faith in Christ. So I believe Any questions well, so far, Simon? Oh, no, just uh, it's it's great. I'm I'm learning stuff. Whenever I speak to you, I'm always learning more about the history of this of this movement. And um, uh, I'm I'm a, when I've spoken to people about the Zionist movement, they typically when you mention the Zion, a lot of people think of you know Jews going back to Jerusalem and and in South Africa. It's a completely different movement that has its roots in, in, in Illinois, in the United States. In fact, um, I think if I'm correct, is, uh, um, Dowie went on to establish Zion City um, and then build a massive church there um, and, and do work there. And then, of course, what's interesting about him, as you said, I think it's important for people to understand that uh, Dowie had some problems and towards the end of his career and life that things kind of fell off the rails and... Um, and so, like I said, it's important for you to point out there. It certainly wasn't perfect because a lot of people would would be very critical of, of Dowie. But maybe you can unpack that for us as well and, and run that out for us as well. Sure. Yeah, at the time, at the time um, when the work kind of transitioned from being headquartered in Chicago to when it, uh, they established the city of Zion. And, um, you know, because this is a movement, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just a church ministry per se. This was a, mo a Christian movement. So they actually were looking to uh, affect not only you know, churches, uh, that would, that's prim primary, but also politics, uh, economy, you know, helping find people jobs, you know, assisting them with industries, and also education. So this was a, a very broad Christian movement. It actually led them to believe that you know, to start a city based on all, you know, including all these aspects of life made sense to them. Um, and, you know, whether or not that was a good idea can be debated. But at that time, I think there was so much going on. And I, I think, um, you know, Dowie, even though he, towards it, at that point, I think, you know, he was dealing with so much and things could have been set up better by him. Um, that, yeah, he made some mistakes theologically, but the church definitely rebounded and recovered and uh, was, you know, stayed on course. Um, but even at that time, you know, he still held to the essential truths of Christianity, you know, repentance, faith in Christ, inerrancy of the Bible. These things never left, even Dowie's message, even though he did get sidetracked at the end of his life on some other things. Um so, yeah, I think um, it's a good lesson. We can always learn from even really important church movements. There's, there's areas to improve upon, and we, we can never lift, you know, one person up more than we should. Uh, we always need to be going back to Scripture, checking everything thoroughly, and looking to keep growing. Um, the runners through the stage now, then, now, now from after the Boer War, and uh, being involved in... In, in helping to heal wounds there and that. Um, take us through the next chapter now of the, the growth of the Zionist church. And um, I think people are going to find this really interesting. Uh, I've had the privilege of kind of looking into the history and on my travels around the country, I've gone out of my way to go and look at some of the places uh, where the Zionists uh, 
uh, kind of have some some history. For example, in, in Wackerstrom, there's a famous brick there where the first baptism amongst the Zulus happened. And there's, I believe, got some some pictures going back to that. I think it's 1903, if my memory serves me correct. And I've actually visit, visited in Wackerstrom the old bridge abutments. Uh, it's kind of overgrown now, but you can still see the structures there. And um, from where that photograph, exactly where that photograph was taken as well, that was the first baptism, as I understand. But maybe walk us through that period then, and that would be interesting. Yes, I'd love to go see that place as well. I, I, that's one of my favorite pictures of the history. Um, so, yeah, I think a way you can try to break it down in terms of these very early years, you know, how exactly did this movement take off in South Africa? You'd have to understand... Um, maybe four families to start with, and then from there we'll go a little bit further. Um, there was a man named Johannes Buchler, and he actually, um, he was South African, and he contacted Dowie and Zion, and expressing their desire that they wanted to be associated with this church movement. And they actually already started to teach, you know, based on the teachings of this church movement. And uh, he asked, you know, how to go about being associated now. So he actually became the first uh, Zion leader, Johannes Buchler, um, and he kind of got the ball rolling in terms of, you know, things really started to happen from there. And then, of course, that was just before the war. So then right after the war, um, I believe it was him who kind of uh, also reached out to two other ministers and, uh, and their wives also played a role. Um, for example... You had uh, Peter LaRue. Now, the interesting thing about him is that he was from the Dutch Reformed Church. He was very much influenced by Andrew Murray. Uh, he wanted to be a teacher, then was led into the ministry, studied uh, down in Cape Town. Um, and he, he became a missionary for the Dutch Reformed Church and actually became what they said was the most successful missionary, I think, at that time for the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, among the Zulus, and many, many people were, were being brought into to that church at that time. And um, he ended up leaving the Dutch Reformed Church because um, he, he wanted to join the Zion movement as it was being established in South Africa. The issue, one of the issues for him was the, the uh, baby baptism issue with the Dutch Reformed Church. He didn't feel that that was biblical. And uh, that was one of the issues where he felt like he had to leave that church and then join the Zion movement. And he actually brought with him converts from the Dutch Reformed Church into the Zion work. So if you think about the first African Zionists, many of them were from the Dutch Reformed Church, which I think is really interesting. Obviously, they adopted the teachings of the Zion movement. You know, say, I say, for example, on that issue, uh, as, as an example. Um, so that was a major step in terms of the establishment of the Zion work. You had people like LaRue, um, a very successful missionary, now joining the work, bringing with him people from that those congregations or people he was ministering to. Another example was um, Edgar Mahan. Now, he had a totally different background. He was from the Salvation Army. His family, before they became converted to Christianity, were part of the saloon industry that was in, I believe, Johannesburg. Um, their family was converted, I think probably most of them, his immediate family, um, through the Salvation Army. He ended up becoming very influential in the Salvation Army, also became a missionary, uh, him and his wife. Um, they both became very sick, and this is where we connect back to Buchler. His wife was related to Buchler. So... Uh, um, Mahan and his wife both became ill, but I think mainly Edgar Mahan. And Johannes Buchler came and decided he needed to, to come and pray for them. And that was one of the things that the Zion movement did emphasize. The Zion movement's not a Pentecostal movement, but it did emphasize the importance of prayer. Even people like uh, Andrew Murray would also agree with that at that time, uh, even though he wasn't as vocal publicly in ministry about it. He would also have agreed. And um, so, uh, anyways, um, Mahan was healed through the prayer of Johannes Buchler. And uh, also at that time, 
um, the Salvation Army didn't believe in baptism, or at least they didn't practice baptism. So that became an issue. So he was healed, and then also interested in baptism, talking to Johannes Buchler. He becomes now, he leaves the Salvation Army over this issue and joins the Zion movement. And um, so you had these two key, uh, I guess you could say, missionary um, couples who, for different reasons, had to leave their previous churches and then join the Zion work. And uh, these were very, very influential people. And their work amongst the Zulus and Sutus was critical. And, and they really did a good job in many ways of uh, reaching so many, but it actually wasn't just them. They, you know, they uh, were clear that they had um, African workers, you know, working alongside them as evangelists and uh, lay preachers, and they actually credited probably a lot of the work to those people, um, even though, you know, they might have been helping to organize things and all that, but when it came to much of the work and ministry, it was really these key African leaders working with them that were doing a great job and just getting the message out to a lot of people quickly. So you had huge growth just in those first couple of years through both of these kind of branches of the Zion work. Um, and like you mentioned, um, the the Wackerstrom was where Peter LaRue, that was kind of his and his team, I think their headquarters. And then um, the Mahans, just to give people an idea of where they were, I believe that was in Harrismith, ended up kind of being the headquarters for that that work. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting uh, just seeing how God brought these people from different backgrounds together. And then to throw in another uh, couple to the mix, you had a, a minister uh, from a Baptist background. His name was Daniel Bryant. His dad was a, a Baptist preacher. and But anyways, he ended up joining the, the Zion movement in America, and um, he really became a, a really important person in the Zion work. Um, Dowie seemed to use him. He kind of moved him around to, like, put out fires here and there, or just maybe for, for different reasons, uh, Brian was very helpful and useful um, with the Zion work. And he ended up, him and his wife, Emma, were, like, the first um, missionary couples sent from the kind of the headquarters church in America to South Africa. And that was also uh, very interesting. He, you know, as I read about him and his own words, he was one of those people, a really good organizer, but one of the, these people that was just uh, incredibly uh, genuine in terms of his faith, incredibly joyful. People just were drawn to him. I think, and uh, his wife, in terms of they really uh, were shining for Christ, uh, just like the others. But each of these couples had very unique personalities, and I think uh, that was all important. But uh, they, they arrived around 1903, 1904, and um, Bryant was sent to kind of start helping the organizational side of the, this movement. As I mentioned, this wasn't just church. We're talking about potentially down the road, industries, uh, schools, um, even politics. One of the things Brian was kind of prepped for was, you know, you got to know the politics of the situation. At that time, English politics played a big role in that. So they even spent time in, in England before arriving in South Africa just so they could know some of the issues that were going on at that time. Um, so they were a very critical uh, or very important couple also that were part of, was part of that initial work. Uh, so things were going, you could say, really well, even though there were challenges. In fact, you know, they, they experienced persecution, you know, maybe from different areas. At the Africans, first, you know, the, the converts from the, the Zulus and Sutus were facing their own persecution, you know, from, say, the African traditional religion groups. Um, fierce persecution. When you read these testimonies, these people were sometimes fleeing for, for their lives. Um, and uh, just uh, they were very courageous and um, stood up to some really uh, immense persecution. From that side, then from uh, even uh, in, say, the English Boer uh, 
culture. There was challenges, I think, that they had to face. Um, so it wasn't easy, but you could say things were going really well at the same time in terms of growth in uh, the church. People were coming to Christ, and uh, great things were happening. And then, uh, then there were some setbacks um, not too long after that. So I don't know, before we transi transition to that, is there anything else helpful, you think, for people to know in terms wow. of those first couple of years? No, that's good. I think that you've shown, um, yeah, through the connections, what a rich history the ZCC have. And I know that most South Africans don't know anything about this. And if you were to tell them this, they, they probably wouldn't believe it. But uh, if you actually go in and start digging around, you can actually go back and see some amazing photographs of the, in fact, John, even on your website, you might even have some original photographs and, and archives. And you can putting the archives together. And if you want to find some, some really amazing pictures. Uh, get in touch with John. I've got some that I keep on my computer and unbelievable work that was happening. I think one of the things that struck me was the number of uh, converts in Vakristrom. I think the number was a couple of thousand. They are estimated within a few years. So this, was a, this wasn't a small uh, a movement. It was substantial and uh, has a rich tradition and interesting connections between uh, Christians coming from different denominations and coming together and and uh, it really is a, a, a beautiful history and, and I think a, a testimony of the power of the gospel to kind of, um, you know, transcend cultural issues and language issues and, and the, the political tensions and everything else that was very much a part of the turbulent um, history of South Africa. So, yeah. So maybe we can now transition on to the next phase of the, uh, the Zionist movement, um, John. Yes. Um Unfortunately, there a few things happened that really jolted the early success and then kind of explains some of what has happened then ever since with the movements. Um, one of the things, there was, a, there was a move, another movement called the Ethiopian Movement um, that was also emerging at that time. And what that was, was it was uh, kind of more mainline churches were being influenced to break away from from maybe more headquarter churches. And what that did was it kind of encouraged uh, the movement, the Zion movement, to kind of start, start to head into another direction, uh, maybe incorporating traditional African religious customs into the church. But before we get there, there's a few other things. Um, the Bryants, um, they actually needed to return back to the States uh, which, you know, was unfortunate. It would have been better, I think, uh, since they were helped get things started for them to stay longer. But unfortunately, they had to return back to the States, which left a gap. Uh, another thing that happened was uh, Peter LaRue, he actually left the Zion work and joined the Apostolic Faith uh, Mission. And now that was a Pentecostal movement that came uh, it was connected back to the Azuzu um, uh, event, that, which started Pentecostalism. Uh, that was in California. Uh, that movement then was coming to South Africa, and it arrived in 1908. And uh, so Peter LaRue actually then left the Zion movement and joined the Apostolic Faith Mission. Um, and what happened was, I think he thought that those who were working with them and those he was ministering to, I think he thought that those people were going to just follow him into the apostolic faith mission. But because these people were so affected by, or, you know, so excited about the Zion movement, they were unwilling to leave, I think, most of them. So that was, a, it was kind of a day of parting between LaRue and all these, you could say, like I said, thousands of people um, that he was also working with. So there was a break at that point. And it was kind of a critical point. I mean, uh, things were really starting to go well. Now you've got this, this break. And, um, you know, I think that had an effect. So now you had two couples that uh, were no longer here and a part of that work uh, directly. And then you, you had... Um, uh, of course, you had the African workers that were working with LaRue, but um, 
so they you know they tried to carry on and but then what you started to see was um, all these different breakaways happening um, and then now you instead of having kind of one central strong church movement you have a lot of these segments you know breaking off and um, now the Mahans and, and his team of people um, and he and each of these guys were working with some incredible African uh, leaders, and they were very strong and, and dynamic as well. Uh, for example, Timothy Mabuza, just to name one that uh, Edgar Mahan was working with, you know, he was just a solid, uh, consistent um, worker in that movement, an evangelist, and uh, just carried on the rest of his life pretty much devoted to that work. Um, on the side with working with uh, Peter LaRue, you had people like Daniel Nicanyane. Um, so you had these very strong uh, people and leaders uh, who were trying to carry on. But unfortunately, yeah, you did see a lot of these groups breaking off from one another so that the movement really became a, a movement of like many, many uh, church groups. So uh, like today, you... <laughs> We don't know exactly how many, but we could be talking thousands and thousands of different Zion groups. So um, ZCC, now that brings us to the ZCC, that was just one of those groups that kind of split off from this early work. So now that is that is probably the largest uh, of the Zion groups in South Africa. Um, they have, you know, uh, it's a big group. As, as you guys are aware. Um, but there's like thousands of other Zionist groups that would all kind of be tracing their roots back to uh, the same start of the Zion movement in South Africa. So that kind of explains what happened. So rather than it growing as one connected movement, uh, now things were just splitting uh, at that point, uh, which really weakened it, you know, in terms of keeping to the strong core of Christianity. So what happened was now this Ethiopian movement, I think it was called, you know, was, was emerging at the same time. So that kind of then drew uh, the Zion movement over kind of towards the traditional African religion. So now when you, um, you know, with the Zionist groups today, now, it, it really depends on the Zion group. Some might totally be separate from those things. Others might be including those customs in the church. So it really depends. Um, there's a, a wide range of you know, where these different groups are theologically. But what happened was uh, there was like a... Um, a disconnect then between the, these various Zion groups, most of them, not all, but for most of them and kind of their their roots and their connection to the, the, the church that kind of was part of starting this work until um, kind of around the 1970s. So you had this long period of time where there was very little, if not much interaction. In fact, in America, it's almost like they most of the church didn't really know what was happening here in South Africa in terms of the growth. Uh, and many were shocked when they heard that there was millions of people in South Africa that were tracing their roots back to the same church movement. At that point, there was a lot of work that was done on both sides to try to bring back the connection. And um, now the, the, the group that Mahan was working with, they were an exception they actually stayed kind of on course in terms of the teachings of Zion. Um, so you kind of always had this segment that stayed on course in terms of the original intention of the movement. Uh, they still remained evangelical uh, Protestants, you know, in their, in their faith. Uh, but they were a very, very small in comparison to the numbers that we're talking about. So, but what happened in the uh, kind of around the 70s, I think you could say, now we, you know, both sides were becoming aware of, of, of the, what has happened, and there was interest, you know, to 
have more of an association. So um, trips were made, you know, over to South Africa to try to help reestablish things. And what kind of what was left from the Mahan um, side of the branch of the ministry that continued. That actually became uh, a way to now they kind of rather than focusing on their own denomination, you could say they decided that they were going to focus on trying to reach the rest of the Zionists, you know, with uh, providing uh, biblical training, for example, because uh, as time went on from that point, there became more and more of an interest in formal uh, Bible teaching uh, on the part of many of these Zionist groups. And um, so this ministry was established. Uh, now the name became Zion Evangelical Ministries of Africa. And that's that actually is part of that same branch going all the way back to Mahan. Now it has this new name and kind of this new focus of now trying to respond to all these other Zionists who are asking for help. And um, I believe it was said by one of the missionaries, you know, maybe it was for the late 80s, 90s, where there was actually becoming a very intense uh, desire on the part of Zionists to study the Bible. And that's when these Bible schools really started to be uh, launched. It's called Zion Evangelical Bible School. And it's a four-year program um, that really is it's a foundational program of uh, studying the Bible and church administration. And that's at that point, kind of the late, maybe more in the 90s, it, it, this really uh, began, began to take off. And many, many people were requesting these schools. There's another course called This We Believe, which is more of an evangelistic tool laying the very foundation of uh, the gospel and church. So uh, you had tools like these that uh, were being requested, you know, by various Zionist groups. And um, so it's really grown from that point in terms of many uh, people coming to study at these Bible schools, which are located in different parts around South Africa and some other countries too, uh, Swaziland, uh, Mozambique, and uh, some work was started in Zimbabwe more recently. So okay. uh, the movement had just been it has spread north from South Africa, and now these Bible schools and uh, this ministry is also trying to, to reach out wherever uh, we're invited uh, to go uh, the best that we can. So it's, it's, what's exciting is that uh, you could almost say like there's an awakening uh, happening amongst these groups. They're kind of realizing the roots that they come from. That's definitely a part of it. As they themselves learn more about the history, you can imagine, you know, they're just uh, amazed. The more and more they learn about their own history and what, you know, people believed in the church before then. Um, is really helping them to come back to, you know, where the movement was intended to go. It was never intended to go into this syncretistic direction, which is what happened by and large. But now uh, many of these people are wanting to rather leave that and go back to the original intention of the movement, which was very much uh, gospel-centered, um, but even more than, I mean, uh, we're talking about education, we're talking about uh, economy. How can we thrive as Christians, make sure we can support our church, our families and churches? Um, it was kind of a middle-class movement. It appealed to many middle-class people, um, construction workers. Um, they just wanted to, you know, have a, a decent living and things like that. So, anyways, these people are um, Zionists here are really becoming hungry to study the Bible as they learn more about where they come from. And uh, it's really exciting uh, just to, to see God working in their lives. Yeah, and I think that the, what I appreciated about the history is, um, in some sense, it was quite, when I was studying into it a bit, when, the, when you had that fracturing of the AFM, the splintering of the organization, and of, of course you had, at the same time, the, the, the ZCC, which is very well known in South Africa because of 
how 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 prominent they are in public and of course at Easter time they have their pilgrimage up to Polokwane every year, millions up to Moira, millions of people go up there. But it's actually a much broader movement and you often use the term Ama Zioni, uh, refers to the people of Zion, these and splintered groups and and some of them went more syncretistic than others, and Mahan's uh, uh, group was was um, a little bit more orthodox. Um, but for me, that's a fascinating history. And, and uh, to a lot of South Africans out there, you, you will often see these individuals uh, clothed, particularly when they're going to worship in, in these colorful robes um, that they wear, and you often drive past them and, and see them. Um, but they, they are affiliated historically to the, to the ZCC movement as well. And uh, what struck me when we did work with you a few years ago was, uh, was the effectiveness of these, um, these Bible schools that you have. And just to all you pastors out there who are listening um, in South Africa, uh, Christian leaders of influence and in f- different churches and, and to other Christians of influence, um, you know, there are thousands of Zionists in South Africa, millions of them, literally. I mean, they represent maybe 20% of the population of the country. And uh, there is an awakening that's happening within them. And just this whole strategy of God reconnecting the American church, where it has so much history, you guys coming back here and, and connecting with them and showing them this history and starting these Bible schools has just been so rich, you know, to to see the hunger that I experienced in those classes, uh, you know, we, we, we sat there and I think it was three hours and they, they don't get off their seats that you can just keep feeding. There was such a desire to learn the word. I mean, a lot of white congregations, you can't preach for longer than 20 minutes and people are bored out of their skull, you know, which is sad to see the kind of hunger that there was and, and the simplicity of the ministry as well, because I think, it's true to say, and uh, speaking from a, a, a Christian who's white in South Africa, a lot of white South Africans would panic if they had to have a conversation with a ZCC member or an Amazon. They wouldn't even know where to begin the conversation, let alone suppose it goes somewhere. What do you do with that person? Do you pluck them out of their community and plonk them in your your church? I mean, and uh, my suggestion to them is absolutely not. Um, what I suggest you do, and I'm going to, would recommend you is get in touch with uh, this organization and encourage the Zionists to go to the Zeb's Bible schools, Zion Evangelical Bible schools. And the reason why it's so effective is because at these schools, uh, they're not going to be pulled for their context in their communities. They're going to be at people. And uh, the Bible's, the Bible's uh, commitments, as I understand them, John, are, are pretty basic. That is to understand the power of just exposing people and expositing the Word of God, just teaching biblical truth and trusting in the transformative power of, of the Word of God. And I've seen it with my own eyes. And um, so for those of you out there, you know, connect or help uh, Zima start more Zeb's Bible schools, encourage the Zionists to go to their schools. It's their history. And there they can have... Um, people training them who are also uh, more able to deal with some of those difficult issues. You know, if you're going to have to deal with some issues of syncretism, as I know, theologically, having studied those issues, those can be complicated and challenging for most Christians and who don't have that background or appreciate some of those issues. But with your schools, you deal with those issues on a consistent basis. And so for me, when I came across your ministry, I was, I, I, I still, I mean, it, for me, it's, it's one of the most significant ministries in South Africa, if not the most significant in terms of just pure strategy, in terms of numbers. Um, I know of no other organization uh, that has as much potential to reach so many people, so many South Africans with a, with a biblical foundation. And to go to a place and see the hunger was really quite striking to me. I, 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 I marvel at that. Of course, my experience continues because of the university, as we discussed the other day on the phone, John, is you see on every university I've been on, you see many ZCC students and they proudly wear their lapels and they have most university campuses that I know of have ZCC clubs. And, um, but people are reluctant to, to approach them, particularly white Christians, and to talk about the lapel, you know, and to, to discuss that with them because they actually know nothing about it. And I found personally that by learning something of the history and just pointing to the lapel and say, look, Tell me about that. 
t- tell me about that badge. Tell me about the history of that thing. And it just changes the conversation. It's amazing. And I, I just encourage all Christians and South Africans out there, here's a starting place for you. Learn something of the rich history of this movement. It's deep Christian ties to the scriptures. And, and, and learn something about John and his ministry and his team. Find out about them. Support them as churches. Uh, recommend them. Connect. I, I want you to bother John with lots of emails and phone calls. Make his life miserable, saying we want to start a Z school. Yeah, we want to reach the Zionists. Come help us. I mean, I get very excited about this ministry because I've seen it personally with my own with my own eyes, and and um, I just wish that and hoping that through this interview, more people can come to find out. Anyway, I'm going to get off my little hobby horse now and uh, and and let you maybe. Add something else, John. Is there anything else you would like to um, suggest from your side? Because the strategy is the Z schools and the ministry amongst the Zionists and the history is so important. But what else can you share with us that you think would be important and of encouragement to, to Christians in South Africa? Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you, what you're saying, uh, Simon. It's very encouraging and, and exciting to see what God is doing helping to bring many of these people back to, you know, uh, evangelical Christianity. And, um, yeah, there's so much potential here. Um, and, yeah, it's very exciting to think about the impact that that would have, you know, a continual awakening amongst the Zionists, such as the ZCC and these other groups, um, you know, uh, just becoming very strong Christians, you know, in this country and these other countries. It would have a major impact in every sphere of, of life, uh, politics, uh, the economy, all these other things, along with church, uh, which is the most important. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah, you can pray about uh, opportunities, how the Lord might have you get involved. Um, if you are interested, yes, please do get in touch with us at Zion uh, Evangelical Ministries of Africa. Um, opportunities could be these Bible schools, uh, other also other new ministry opportunities that are also very exciting. Um, so yeah, it's it's just great what God is doing, and uh, yeah, we just encourage you, like you're saying, Simon, uh, just to pray about how the Lord might have uh, each of you be involved in some way. It's a really important work in this country. Yes, yes, yeah, uh, and I think it is, and. Um, uh, I, I'm just wanting to, to encourage more people to, to do some research on this and to get in touch with Sim and, and John and his team. Um, could you just explain where exactly do you currently have teams at the moment in South Africa? Um, where are they located and what parts of the country? Okay, so some of the different um, locations where the Bible schools are, for example? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here in the Eastern Cape, you know, East London, Port Elizabeth, um, and then Western Cape down in Cape Town, um, uh, KZN, uh, yes, around the Durban area, north of Durban, out west of Durban, um, Hauteng, there's much work going on there in that area. Um, so yeah, those would be kind of the, the key areas at the moment in South Africa. And then, um, yeah, in Swaziland, some important work going on there. Um, so, yeah, um, those would be some of the key spots at the moment. Okay, okay. And I said, to, in, in terms of helping churches uh, in a practical way, that could be helping to establish Bible schools um, and just um, becoming familiar with how it is that you approach the Zionists and what you found has been effective to work amongst them and to, and to serve them really. That's what I love about the ministry is, is serving. Yes. And, and to say if people are not from those areas, that might mean there's an opportunity for work to begin in, in new areas. So, um, I think basically literally all over there's opportunities. So if there's not say a Bible school, well, that means there's probably a very good opportunity in that area to start a Bible school, if at all possible. Uh, so it'd be worth starting that conversation in some of these other areas, you know, where, where there's not currently ministry, because like you said, um, it's literally, it could very well be a quarter of the population of the country that belongs to this movement. So 
literally everywhere in the country. Yes, yes. Um, uh, just a few questions then, uh, John, since uh, you probably get these um, uh, all the time. Um, how, how, explain to us how it is that um, things move in, 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 the, in, the, in the... I'm interested to know what happens uh, when, when a group of Zionists come into a Bible school. Um, perhaps you could share with us what actually happens as they go through the scriptures? What are the kinds of transformations you're seeing there from from the pastors to congregants when they begin to go through the scriptures? Just talk a bit to us about what actually happens there in those Bible schools for us. Yes. Uh, well, sometimes it, it will start um, through this other course called This We Believe, which really lays clearly, you know, explains clearly uh, the gospel message. You know, starting with the authority of the Bible, you know, who is God, and then looking closely at, um, you know, God's character. We look at the Son of God, the Holy Spirit, sin, you know, um, just uh, God's design for the church. We talk about salvation. So we go through these very key issues of the gospel, and that's where I'd say many, you know, really come to the Christian faith. And um, from there, then want further information and then join, uh, sometimes Bible schools are started from those courses. Um, so it really depends on, on their background. Um, but yes, through, uh, as, as you know, the situation is, many of the Zionist groups are experiencing you know, syncretism. So some of the Bible, some of the traditional African religion, not all of them, but many of them have struggled with this so these are the issues that do come up, you know, in the teaching. But the teachings of the Bible school are very clear, very straightforward. Um, you know, the Bible is just our key uh, resource, and we just really stick to, you know, the Bible. And it's a very foundational course. You know, for example, Bible survey, going through each book of the Bible, you know, in terms of the church administration, looking at these, you know, key essential parts aspects of church ministry, um, it's just great material. And um, so, yeah, it's, uh, these people are very excited as they have this opportunity to study. Uh, what's really nice is that it's also provided in their language, um, which uh, for some is, is very important because if they're from more of a rural background, you know, uh, they may not be as exposed to other languages. but. Um, so it's, it's offered in the language of that area. And the, the idea is that it's kind of like a distance uh, learning school where we try to bring the classes too close to people, um, so which allows them you know, not to have to move away for the time of study, um, which for many of them is very uh, helpful in terms of their ability then to, to study at the school. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just very exciting. Uh, the material is very helpful, very true to scripture, and uh, we have good discussion. They're working through issues. Um, and then there's further study opportunities too. Sometimes people graduate and then say, hey, what, what else can we now, uh, what other program can we enter? So sometimes they go on to study at other Bible schools. Um, Zima tries to help with that. You know, some of these students going to UBI in Peter Maritzburg, ICBM in um, <clears throat> Hao Teng. Um, now we have a, a, an exciting partnership with Mukanyo, who also, also offers distance learning sites. So in East London, we're kind of like the first uh, di Mukanyo distance site in connection with Zebs. We have a partnership with them, and we're hoping to see that um, become you know, and more areas utilizing that, this distance learning through Mukanyo. So we, we try to work with these other Bible schools, you know, in terms of offering further study opportunities, which is key. I mean, if these, as these people become more and more prominent uh, in terms of their influence, you know, this extra study can really help them. And uh, it helps them further work through some of these difficult issues uh, that they have to deal with. So it's just very exciting what what God has been doing, and um, yeah, it's but it's a uh, as as for any of us, uh, you know, we're always being transformed more and more into the 
image of Christ as Christians from all of our different, you know, cultures. And uh, there's issues we all have to, to face and deal with. And um, and there's yeah, no exception for these African people as well. They have unique challenges that they have to confront and work through. And um, so it's just very exciting. And, and one other thing, too, just in terms of the Zion movement, you know, it's interesting some of the reasons why it became so popular here, uh, like, say, in South Africa. But one issue was, from the very beginning, there was a very good camaraderie between, you could say, the whites and the blacks, uh, mutual respect. Um, it really stood out as a church movement in that arena. And I think that's something that also exists today. Uh, you see a great, you know, working together amongst people from different countries. Of course, it's not just this group. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just very exciting to see whites and blacks and people from all different uh, nationalities working together, um, even still today, like it, how it started. Yeah. Um, we've actually got a few questions that have rolled in here, so maybe we can tackle these, John. Um, we have a question here. Um, don't the multiple schisms from the missionary churches of the late 1800s argue for the ZCC being chronically schismatic? Um, um, so we see as you went through the history, it was kind of unified, it was a strong team, and then it fractured, and um, Peter LaRue went one way, the AFM came in, and then, of course, we see the fracturing there. Um, so, yeah, what would you say to that, then, in terms of the... the um, about the, that, that fracturing of the Zionist movement? Yeah, I think um, I won't really get into all the details of some of the different uh, breakaways, but yeah, it definitely, it's hard to pinpoint exactly why that happened, but it kind of started at that point where, you know, these different issues, say LaRue breaking away, he thought people would follow him, they didn't. You had this Ethiopian movement also affecting many different churches in South Africa. It's hard yes. to pinpoint exactly why, but it definitely, at that point, you saw a lot of uh, different breakaway groups. So, yeah, that, that would just be, ZCC is just one of the many. Um, but I, I, wouldn't, I won't get into beyond that um, in terms of where they're at today. Um, yes, yes. Um, would, would you say, um, what pressure do you think um, that we can kind of establish historically was there from the um, the racial side of things um, in terms of uh, attitudes towards uh, white people who were working amongst them? Was there any, historically, do we know of that kind of pressure um, as well from the, the various uh, societies in South Africa following the Boer War, the rise of Afrikaner nationalism, the tension between the English and the Afrikaners. Um, did that also would, would that also factor into some of these uh, fracturing of the relationships between individuals? Or is there anything that we know from the history of the writings of these early founders? Um, yes. Could you just uh, summarize that question uh, for me? Real no, quick I'm just again? trying to ask. I'm just trying to ask the question. Um, to what extent does the do the um, the racial tensions? in that period of South Africa, did they also factor into this? Do we know historically from the writings of these early founders if that was also a factor in, 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 in splitting this group up as well? I mean, um, you know, uh, I know from reading, for example, Robert Moffat, when uh, he went down to Cape Town to go and uh, uh, get the church to see if they would um, help him get the funds to get the printing press to publish the uh, the Bible in the first African, Southern African language, um, a lot of the churches weren't wanting to help him because he was helping black people. I mean, and he says as much in his own writings. And I'm not sure, I've come across that in Robert Moffat's writings. I wasn't sure if there was also that pressure on the culture as well, you know, to keep the divide between white people and black people. Yeah, and um, I think this was a key issue when it came to the Zion movement. They were very, very clear that they didn't want any separation based okay. on nationality. And I think that was one of the reasons this became so popular in South Africa, uh, not only amongst the Anglos and the Boers. I mean, this was fresh after the war. They literally had war wounds at the church where both you know, of those two groups were coming together uh, in the Zion group. And then you had you know, African groups who were kind of caught up in that 
effects of the and after effects of the war, you know, experienced some mistreatment uh, from the war. Um, but it was the design movement was very resolute about they didn't want there to be any separation based on uh, nationality. They were okay. that was one of the things they really pushed, not just in South Africa, in America too. There were issues going on at that time. Um, the Zion movement was really uh, standing strong on, um, you know, the, the equality among nationalities. Okay. Okay. Good. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't um, say that would be uh, one of the. Okay. Of the splits. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Another question then. What uh, standpoint does the um, uh, the ZCC specifically, not necessarily all Zionists, take regarding traditional crucial involvement with and? This is probably a pretty common question. Um, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you could tackle that one for us. So what is the position of the ZCC um, with respect to uh, involvement with ancestors? Okay, yeah, that's. Uh, I won't really get into the exact beliefs of the various different groups, but um, there is a spectrum. So yeah, there will be some Zion groups who will you know, be strongly incorporating beliefs of traditional African religion. Um, it may not, they may not use the exact language of traditional African religion. It might be using other words, but you can see clearly their syncretism. In other groups, it, it isn't necessarily tied into African traditional religion, but it's maybe uh, having different definitions of, of things. Uh, for example, baptism. Um, so you'd have to, you kind of almost have to look group by group and see uh, where they're at, you know, in the spectrum. So I wouldn't necessarily say the ZCC is tied in with ancestral worship per se, um, but it might be in other ways that they, you know, have redefined certain things. Um, so yeah, but I won't, I won't really get into uh, specific beliefs of each group. Okay. Okay. And that certainly has been my experience as well. I think a lot of people just assume that if they are ZCC or Zionists of some kind, that they all kind of are subscribing to this heart, very much uh, devoted connection to um, traditional African religious belief systems. What I've found in my experience is that there's, as you're right, there's a spectrum that can go from very committed to somewhere in the middle all the way to conversations that some sometimes I've had with students on campus, where um, you know they 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 kind of respect that about their thing, but they're quite clear about where they stand on some of these other issues in terms of well, no, I'm not really part of that, you know. So that's been my experience as well. Is it's more of a spectrum. You kind of have to ask uh, the Zionists with whom you're speaking to some extent, to determine where they stand. That's been my experience. Uh, and I've come across I've been other people's experience as well. Um, I'll give you a share of a quick story. So when I was uh, going down to KZN a few years ago, um, we stopped at a petrol station to, um, to uh, fill up, and a, 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 a vehicle pulled up next to the petrol station, two vehicles full of uh, Zionists, and um, they climbed out the vehicle and they were all, you know, going in to go and get a drink and go to the loo and, and, and fuel up for the vehicles. And I happened to notice one of the guys, he was wearing some cup on and at the back he was the pastor. So I, I approached him and um, I just started talking about his, his dress and robes and all the rest of that. And we were actually on our way down to KZN to go and work with Greg and the team at Stanga. And I said to him, well, we're going down there to do some work at the, the Zionist colleges. And he kind of stopped him dead in his tracks. And he said, so what's this all about? And I said to him, well, they're there. They teach the Bible and they um, to, to the Zionists down there. And they're in Stanger and in these areas. And, um, and we got going in a conversation. And his very next sentence to me was, could you come to my church and come and teach us the scriptures? And uh, I just, I, I, I mean, I just. I just stopped dead in my tracks, and I, I, I just I just couldn't believe that, that, that he would just extend that invitation like that. Um, so I learned from that experience that you, you can't just assume um, the stereotype because it's just, it's just not true. Um, you have to kind of ask questions and find out um, where they are because like most 
people in any given church and denomination that are individuals. And so they have their own independent convictions and at some level. And so you, you kind of have to dig a little bit deeper. Um, I think uh, uh, we'll take one more question, John, because I think we're coming towards the end of our time now. Um, uh, just to – let me just see if I can get it up here. Um, I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to miss that one because the phone that's giving me the questions has died. So we'll close then on that then. Um, but uh, just to say, John, thank you very much for your time, um, for, for sharing this with us, and uh, hopefully we can um, uh, hear more from you. Uh, we would love to perhaps um, – hear from some of the um, Zionists themselves. Maybe some of the Zionists would like to come on our on our channel and tell us about the work at the Bible colleges and share their testimonies. We would love to hear from them. So if you can uh, direct some folks to us and to all of the other people listening in on this interview, um, you now know, you know now something of the, the rich history of the Zionist movement, its connections to uh, Christianity going all the way back to the United States and also ties in here in South Africa with Christians from different backgrounds and a beautiful, uh, rich history uh, that went through very difficult times in the history of this nation and without question uh, that amongst uh, uh, many Zionists in this country, God is really uh, beginning to work on their hearts and um, if you're not sure how to begin and work amongst the Zionists, then give John and his team a call. And uh, if uh, there's any other way, uh, like a strategy you're looking for, um, the effectiveness of the Zion Evangelical Bible Schools is, is, is amazing, truly amazing. And if you can help support those schools, help support the Zionists to attend those schools, train up pastors, uh, provide them with resources, scriptures, material, um, and let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God do its job, I think it would take uh, anxiety of a lot of Christians in South Africa on how exactly to begin. So please do um, contact and inundate John's uh, uh, email and uh, phone with all kinds of uh, requests. And uh, that would be a wonderful problem. I'm sure John would be delighted to have. But yes, uh, John, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we miss you. We hope we think when we're down in the Eastern Cape, we can come by Ganubi and see you. And uh, I was in just north of you fairly recently with friends in Matatiel. Um, but uh, we'd love to come down there. It's a beautiful part of the country, and there's beautiful people there. And uh, hopefully we can we can work together and, and serve. And um, yes, thank you so much for your time this evening, uh, John. That's a pleasure. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for what you guys are doing, too. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you to all of you this evening, and thank, of, thank you uh, most of all to Jesus and the liberty and hope that he gives all of us with all our issues and problems, wherever we're from, wherever we're born. Thank you to the liberty he brings to the gospel. And may you, may those of you who don't know Christ listening in this evening come to know him and, and know about his work, about his death and resurrection and the freedom he brings and liberty he brings. So God bless and, and good night to all of you.